Hello, hello. Welcome back to another episode of the Work, Wealth, and Travel podcast. This podcast is the place to be if you are looking to create a lifestyle that you absolutely love. We talk all things lifestyle design, business, travel, entrepreneurship, becoming and sustaining the digital nomad lifestyle, money, and so much more. I'm your host, Nicole, aka Nomad Neeks, and I myself have been nomadic for six years now, which is so wild to think about. And it has definitely been a journey of becoming a digital nomad and through entrepreneurship as well. On today's episode, I speak with Maggie. Maggie is a business and marketing strategist who works with coaches, consultants, and experts to sell their knowledge without selling their time. This was a really interesting episode. Maggie is very clearly an expert in her industry, knows the ins and outs of what she teaches to scale a business without your time being the main factor that is involved within that business to really remove yourself from the business. Free up your time while making more money. We talked all things scaling a business, a coaching business, any type of online business how she fired almost her entire team, but made so much more income. We also chat about how she is a third culture kid, what that means and what it looked like for her growing up in cultures all over the world. This was a very interesting discussion around entrepreneurship, business, but also travel and living a very international lifestyle. So let's dive into it. Let's chat a little bit about your story, where you started, and how you got to where you are today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Um, So I I started uh, out um, as a freelancer, really. I... I (laughs) Uh, graduated uh, from a you know with a master's degree in marketing strategy in uh, during an economic recession, um, right? And after I moved uh, to a different country with a language I didn't speak very well, so I had no chance of finding a job. Although I was like, I'm a special butterfly, I speak like four languages, and I lived in all these countries, and not a single interview in six months. So that got me freelancing, um, which got me you know helping my clients with marketing strategy and seeing their results. Um, and that was eight nine years ago. That kind of got me back on track with marketing and I've been doing, you know, marketing consulting that morphed into business growth strategy because marketing, you know, you can't just do marketing, get more visible. It needs to translate into revenue and profit for your company, which is business growth. So that's kind of a, in a nutshell journey. Yeah. And, um, you know, um, I've, I've always known I wanted to have my own business. I grew up very internationally and just having that freedom of choice and freedom of travel was so important to me. Mm -hmm. So I knew this was places I was going to eventually have my own business. I just didn't think it was going to be this path. Hmm. So I want to touch on that briefly because you spoke about, um, having a background of growing up in different places and having a very culturally diverse background, maybe being a third culture child. I'm not too sure, but how do you think that really played into your entrepreneurial journey? I know you briefly mentioned it, but if you want to go a little bit deeper Mm -hmm. into how an international lifestyle really played into what your, um, present now looks like in your business. Yeah. So just as a, um, you know, in a nutshell, um, I was born in Czechoslovakia and I moved, um, we moved away when I was three years old, fairly soon after the fall of communism, um, to the U S uh, thus I still have a bit of an uh, American accent because that's where I learned English when I was three. Then we moved to Singapore. That's where I really grew up. Um, I went through the local school system. So I was quite often the only white kid in the entire school, uh, which was an interesting experience as well. Um, just in that like, uh, Singaporean education system. Um, and when I was 20, I, decides that it seemed like a good idea to book a one-way ticket to Amsterdam and transfer university and uh, <laughs> ended up here. So really, I think um, it kind of, there's a couple of things here. Firstly, it, because I've lived in so many different cultures and I was so immersed. I always felt like I was an immigrant. I wasn't an expat. Like I was just part of that culture. Um, the culture has rubbed off on me. So I definitely, like my work ethic, including, you know, my perfectionism and um, you know, pushing myself sometimes too hard is definitely a remnant of growing up in Singapore and having that, you know, drilled into me. Um, I think that I am able to communicate really well with people from different cultures and I have a lot more maybe empathy in an understanding of communication, which is very important for marketing and sales. 
So I can understand, you know, someone, you know, a, a designer from the Midwest in the US, I'll probably speak to that person a little bit differently than like um, a financial advisor from Berlin. There's just a different way of communication. And the other big thing that I think um, it really impacts me on is my love for travel. Like I'm constantly looking at like, when's the next flight? When's the next trip? You know, I want to go to this country. Is there a business conference I can go to there as well? So it can make it a business expense. And just, um, you know, having built a business that is location independent, I think part of, a big part of that drive was my desire for for freedom and for for really choice. It's really interesting that you mention how you think and interact with people differently due to you being immersed in many different cultures as a child and growing up. And I think that's a really interesting perspective because I've been in many different cultures, but not as a child. And so I think to have that child perspective is something that you don't hear too often. And I'm sure, well, like you said, it does come into play in a major way in your business. It really does. And I think, you know, language wise it's impacted me because you know I was lucky enough that we moved to the US when I was so young so I consider English to be my first language and I'm that's where all my education has been in and I think that with travel with with having that experience as a child especially I'm very adaptable you know situations change and you just roll with it and you learn how to stand up for yourself you learn how to go make friends in different places even if you're an introvert and those are all really important skill sets to have as an entrepreneur as a business owner like I remember when I moved from Singapore to the – and Singapore is always kind of considered a bit like more outspoken. I was literally even told to tone down my personality if I wanted to be successful. And when I moved to the Netherlands, I was suddenly surrounded by like really tall, loud Dutch people who just will ask questions in class. And in Singapore, you don't do that because, you know, if – if you, if it sounds like you don't know something, you're probably not that smart, which is just like, you know, you don't ask questions in Singapore that like in school too much. Um, so suddenly I was like, oh my gosh, I had to force myself to go and like talk to people because I suddenly, there was, it was such a culture shock. And again, that's, that impacts, if you have that kind of experience, that's going to impact you in terms of how you go out and get, get clients, how you go out and like put yourself out there, how you look at your visibility and your growth. Questions, I've, things I've never thought of. Um, so it's really interesting to hear it from your perspective and your life experience. So let's transition into business. Now, you said you've been in business for quite a few years. What did it look like when you were first starting? I'm sure you've had probably quite a few different transitory periods within your business over the years. So what made you think, you know, this is what I want to go in? And then what were the first starting steps for you as a business owner? That's a great question because I think um, my business has really evolved a lot. Um, the last like six years or so, I would definitely say like that was, you know, business and marketing strategist and like around business growth and mentorship. Before that, it was just, a, it was a mess. It was like, I will do anything that I can get my hands on. I will, you know, do your copywriting. I will do your um, app store text. I will do your, figure out your ads. I'll code your website, do your logo. You know, wasn't very good at that stuff, but people paid me and seemed happy. And did you do results. all of this yourself or did you have a team who did some of this work as well? I did everything myself. This was the beginning. Wow. Google it, YouTube it, learn it, do it, sell it. <laughs> but you know, obviously it wasn't sustainable and I was, I was doing stuff that I just wasn't very good at and didn't, wasn't enjoying like coding websites, for example. And what I do really enjoy mm -hmm. is just helping people grow their businesses and seeing the patterns and seeing the, like connecting the dots for them. Someone says to me, hey, I'm now here. I'm making like, you know, 3000 a month, 5000 a month, but it's not really consistent. How do I get to, you know, and I'm feeling overworked and I'm not making the money I want. How do I get to $10,000, $15,000 a month while working less? And for me, that's such a fun question to dive in. Like I love seeing the possibilities. I can very, very quickly see the p potential pathways for someone to get from where they are to where they want to go. In you saying that, I'm curious, what do you think are some of the core elements that somebody would need to have in place in their business in order to grow and scale their business past, you know, 10 or 20K months, something that is really a dream income for them and then mm -hmm. pass that? Yeah. So past 10, 20K a month, um, I basically always say uh, some kind of high ticket offer is going to make your life so much easier. Unless you have like a really big audience that most people do not, I would be aiming for like your bread and butter coming from high ticket offers, which should be 
you know, any anywhere above like two, three thousand dollars for that offer. And that could be one to one, that could be group group coaching programs, that could be masterminds, whatever that offer is. Um, and obviously like there's a lot of nuance here. So it's not the right fit for every market, it's not the right fit for every experience. But if you're asking me how do you get to like 10, 20k a month and beyond, I'm like, make sure you have a high ticket offer that you can sell for at least three thousand dollars. Mm-hmm. Then you need some kind of lead generation process. Like how are you getting in front of new people regularly, right? This is part of my avalanche method that I teach. It's three phases. First, how are we getting in front of new people regularly on the daily on a daily basis? Posting on Instagram is not enough here. Like that's not that's not the way unless you are like a real con- true content creator and you are happy to be on Reels all day. Yes, that's going to grow you forward, but not otherwise. Um, secondly, we need some kind of authority nurture process in place. That way comes through your content. Most people are really good at this stage, but they skip the first and the third stage. And when you're talking about content, you also need to focus on how are you showcasing the transformation you provide your clients? It's not just, here's my offer and you get X amount of coaching calls. No Mm -hmm. one cares. Sorry, but like Mm -hmm. no one really cares. And the third phase is the sales phase. How are you now converting those people and showing them the value of what you do? Are you asking for the sale? Are you reaching out in DMs? Are you talking about your offer? Are you sharing like client results? Most people kind of stick to the safe stuff, which is posting on Instagram and kind of sharing some content and like giving the air quotes value. But one, they're not adding enough people. So they're not in front of enough people. And two, they're probably not doing the right kind of content. And three, they're not asking for the sale. If you're saying like, hey, I want to get a 10, 20K a month, one, beyond one-to-one clients. So at one point, let's say you have a three, I'm like going way into, in a, a way, way deep here. The other thing I would add on here as a nuance is not just having that high ticket offer being high ticket, but having it be a leveraged offer. If you're at like three to 5K a month and you're like, Maggie or Nicole, how do we hit 10K a month? I'm like, cool. Make sure you have a high ticket offer. Don't be selling like your services by the hour or like one-off sessions. That's not, you just don't have, you can't get, it's so hard to get the volume to get a 10K. Mm-hmm. If you're at, how do I get a 10 to 20K without burning out? That's where a leveraged high ticket offer comes in. So that's when you're no longer just doing one-to-one coaching or strategy work or services, but you're now having some kind of group coaching program, mastermind, a hybrid leveraged offer, which means that you're scaling your time. Because at one point, like the high ticket offer stuff, that sounds great, but you can't take on more clients. You don't have hours left in the day. Like everything you mentioned, but at the end, when it's, when you mentioned, you know, you only have so much time in the day. And it sounds like that is probably something that you experienced from kind of doing absolutely everything. And so you knew that it was time for a pivot and you needed something else. And I also really appreciate you mentioning about sometimes what you think you're doing is not really enough. I realized a while back, actually, that posting on Instagram was really not moving anything forward for me because unless I was very active on stories with a very engaged community, me just posting and getting in front of maybe 100 eyeballs or something like that on average every day is not going to truly push the needle forward. So it's really being critical with thinking what is worth my time and actually doing. I know a lot of people now who are moving towards LinkedIn or different platforms that feel more authentic to connection and to their business over something like Instagram or Facebook where, I mean, that does definitely work for some businesses, but not for all. Yeah. Absolutely. And like things change so quickly. Um, So, you know, in six months, this conversation will look different, but the principles are the same. Are you getting in front of enough people? Are they the right people? Are you explaining why they need you in a way that they actually care about? And are you asking for the sale? Mm -hmm. And most people are not doing this. This is not something I realized, you know, when I was doing all things as a freelancer, um, I I made this shift actually two years ago. I was a booked out coach and strategist. So I was making 10K, 15K a month. Uh, fully booked out, could not take clients, building a wait list. And I was burning out. So I had hit like that holy grail of coaching consistent 10K months. Mm-hmm. And I was like, one, I needed to have a team of seven contractors to do all the launch stuff and graphics and everything. Because I was trying to launch via, like grow and scale via courses. And then very quickly realized like, I just, I don't have the audience size I need to make the numbers work here. And I hate having a big team. Like, you know, I was getting Slack messages all day, every day, (laughs) 
questions only Maggie could answer. And that's obviously like a lot of that is down to me. And like, you know, I should have had better processes and systems, which I do now. Um, but that's where I said, I, I'm done. I basically burnt down my business model almost overnight. I just, in the middle of my launch, I said, this is the last live round of this course I'm doing. We're changing after this. And I shifted into what's now the Evergreen Empire, which is my core group coaching program on helping coaches and consultants get to, you know, 10K a month consistently. Mm. Because for me, that the answer was one-on-one coaching is great. It's great when you're starting out. I still love working one-to-one with certain clients, but to get to where I want to go and for my clients to get to where they want to go, the leveraged offer, like the, a really well done group offer is so much more impactful, not just for, not just for your, on your income, but also on how many people you can help. So I'm curious in you saying all of this, if you didn't have the systems and processes in place that you do now, and obviously you didn't know back then what you know now, what did it look like for you to scale to 10, 20 K months with a team of seven how did you get from zero to that? And then realizing, of course, you know, I'm burnt out. This model needs to change. Um, but what did that growth look like for you? Yeah. It was literally through chaos. Like I got there through chaos, through doing all the things. And when I say all the things, I mean, I, I ran live events. I sold retreats. I did, I sold courses, small courses. I ran like six month masterminds, three month masterminds, you know, did launch plans for people, did the one-on-one client stuff. Um, there was just a lot of stuff happening and it was just a mess. And I realized like I have ADHD, so I'm constantly chasing that dopamine. At the time I realized that was just getting me more and more frazzled. I needed to focus my attention. And at the time shifting all of my energy into like one core offer was the best thing I could have done for my mental health at the time. And like, I, you know, I shared this with you earlier when I made that switch two months later, I had a $73,000 month. Three months after that, I had a $124,000 month month. I was like, what is happening? Like, what is, what is happening? You know, how I got from zero to 10 K a month probably took me like five, six years just trying all the things and seeing really, really, really slow growth. And it was just exhausting. So that was, you know, I think six months before that, my husband sat down with me, you know, looked over my end of your accounts and said, like, listen, I know how hard you work and you'll be making more per hour if you worked behind a cash register somewhere. Like, this is not sustainable. That very hard conversation also lit a fire under my ass of like, well, you know, I have really big dreams. I have really big vision. I really want to not just build a business for myself, but I want to help as many people as possible grow their own businesses. It's time to get serious and it's tar- it's time to start start doing the stuff I don't feel like doing, like systems and processes and looking at not just what's fun and exciting, but what is necessary. Yeah, what's necessary to build a sustainable business. If you saying all this, I need to ask, and maybe you don't know, but what Enneagram type are you? Do you know? <laughs> oh my gosh. I've done it like, I get a different answer every time. I think I'm a three. <laughs> yeah. You sound like a three to me. Yeah. What it, are the three? Like, hold on. I have to Google this. <laughs> Threes are like very ambitious, very driven to make the money, to reach their goals. <clears throat> And threes are a lot of online business owners and entrepreneurs are threes, a lot of the ones who are really big. And so I love the Enneagram. I think it's so accurate. Mm-hmm. I don't know your thoughts on it, but in you saying all of this, I'm like, you sound like a three, but I need to know what you are. I think I'm a three. I would have to double check this because I know I've done it a few times and I got a different answer a couple of times. So it probably depends on how I feel. So I can be super, amb- I am very ambitious, but at the same time, like I also love to like chill in my leggings on the couch in front of the PlayStation. Yeah, so. <laughs> and it's, it's funny that you say that because sometimes, and I think not sometimes, all the time, behind the scenes of being a business owner, a lot of people obviously don't see and a lot of people don't share that side of their life on their social media. Mm-hmm. But you do need those days. And I'm curious what that looks like for you. You do need those days where sometimes I'm just like, I, I just, I can't today. I yeah. mentally just need a break. And that's, I think at least that's the beauty of having my own business and doing something that is my own and also having a team behind me is that I can delegate things to them. But sometimes, you know, I'm just having an off day and it's difficult to struggle through. And so I try to not force myself to just get through that day and just intuitively do what my body needs. Yeah. No, I, I for sure. I think so on one hand, I think sometimes you do not have to push through. It's just like, 
there is a deadline or there's a project or like people sometimes get into like money situations like you just have to go and do the thing you need to do go get disciplined and do, do it at the same time balance it out i have a boat <laughs> um uh, i live in amsterdam on a canal so we have a like one of the boats that kind of like it's it's made for like sitting in and sipping a glass of rosé in the summer so it's just super chill um so when the sun comes out in the netherlands that's what i love to do even if it's for like an hour i also play a lot of video games so i've actually recently started combining video games and business um i do a live stream where i play a video game and i answer business questions at the same time and that's so cool do fun. you do that on twitch or something or where do you do that yeah i just like i stream it so it's also on twitch but it's also in my facebook group um um hmm. and it's i play age of empires which is like a medieval city building kind of game so it's super it's pretty chill because it's like i need something that i can like concentrate on while answering questions mm-hmm. um so I, I spend a lot of my time doing that like i I'm a, i love fantasy my dog's name is frodo you know i think incorporating those elements as well of like video games and fantasy and like my love of travel and my love of like freedom i've really tried to express my personality in my business with that as well oh well, i think that's a great idea i've never thought of kind of marrying the two things together of something, some aspect of your business that can push you forward in your business, like helping people in your Facebook group, but then also doing something that you really enjoy. So I think that's really cool. And that's an interesting idea I'm going to sit on. So I'm curious now, what adjustments have you made within your business to cater to your chronic illness and ADHD? What has that journey within business looked like for you? I think a big one was that shift I, I mentioned I made two years ago. Um, be- that's something I did mention. Be- I do have a chronic illness. It's quite unpredictable. And when I was trying to grow that way, you know, I if I have a had a launch coming up, or I had a fully booked out schedule of client calls and I started getting a flare up, it was like, what are you going to do? You've got 12 calls the next two, three days that need to be rescheduled. And you don't have space to like actually reschedule them. It caused a lot of stress. And I realized like I, that's kind of what made me realize actually the chronic illness stuff was I've built my business into a golden cage. I can't quite escape from. Mm -hmm. And the team is not helping. I thought like, oh, you just hire people and they'll do it. That was not the case at all. So it's interesting. I'm now making, you know, quite a lot more than I was back then. And I have one part-time team member and that's it. And it's a multi six figure a year business. Hmm. I was just, I was going to actually ask you that before you said that at the end, when you said you fired seven team members. So now that one part-time, maybe contract freelancer team member, what does that role look like? And how do you take on the roles or have you eliminated some of the roles that those seven people were filling? Yeah, I eliminated a lot because again, it was, you know, what we were talking about earlier, I really thought about what's actually moving the needle forward for me. I'm doing all these things, but my brain is constantly feeling like it's in chaos. Mm -hmm. I always feel behind. There's always something like a fire to put out, but what's actually moving the needle forward for me. So I, I cut down a lot. So you know, I had a podcast that I stopped doing. Um, cause although I loved it, I was like, well, is it getting me an ROI right now? Not that I know of. Is there something else I could be doing with my time and mental energy that has a higher ROI for what I need right now? Yes. Okay. Put that on pause for a while. You know, and when I stopped doing launches, there was just a lot less marketing <laughs> shit to do. Yeah. Um, I was by myself for almost a year. So the the big months that I mentioned, like the 124K uh, month, that was solo with without a team hmm. because I focus on such a minimalist business model of what's moving the needle forward for me. What does like my lead gen process look like? What does my sales process look like? What can I automate? How can I give the best value to my clients in a leveraged offer? And only almost a year later, I hired again and I actually ended up hiring my sister who had just quit her job and her apartment and had booked a one-way flight to Mexico to go travel. And I was just like, want to come work for me? (laughs) Um, So she's now like somewhere in the mountains of Argentina, you know, working for me part-time. And um, she's doing more of the implementation stuff. We were kind of looking at what's all the, what's all the stuff that needs to happen in the business and what does it need to be actually physically done by Maggie? So, so we're shifting things that way. But we we first had to get really brutal with what's actually necessary. Where can we add processes? Where can we add systems? Where can we automate? I love that. And I love that you hire your family. I mean, if they have the skill set, then why not? So to wrap things up, um, now I'm curious, 
to align your business and your life. If somebody is listening who is looking to start a business or has an idea and they just don't know where on the business spectrum of things to start, whether it be online business, um, how would you recommend for them to align their business to their life? And maybe what did that look like for you? And then what would your recommendation be for somebody who's just starting out? I think if you're starting out, like just think about your skill sets, the skill sets that you have. Um, it's tempting to try to help everyone do everything, but it's so important to pick one specific person you can help. And, you know, I think it's really important to note if you are listening to this conversation, like I've been doing this stuff for almost a decade. I've like, I've gone through so many pivots. I've made so many mistakes. So you're listening to like a summary of years and years and years of experience don't compare, you know, your step one to my step eight, Mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's going to set yourself up for like mental failure here. So think about who you can help. What's the outcome you can help them do and go tell them you can help them make that outcome. And that could just be like looking through your phone, looking at who, you know, and just sending them a message. One of the beautiful things um, about having your own business is that you, you are in control. You get to decide, do I want to get more clients and make more money? Yes. Great. Here's the things I have to go do. And you're not reliant, reliant on someone else's, someone else sending you a paycheck. Kind of at the beginning there about you are on year 10. So I think that's something that is not really talked about enough and and or on social media, we kind of see the glorified, oh, you know, I hit 100K a month or whatever that amazing goal may look like. But You have so much experience in business and life that has brought you to where you are today and it's been 10 years in the making. And I think that is something that a lot of people don't see or don't think about when they're just comparing, oh, I started my business six months ago. Why am I not hitting these amazing goals? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it took me like six or seven years before I had a 100K year. And that was revenue. That wasn't profit. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. I, I appreciate that. I love talking anything monetary, money goals. I think that's really important and sometimes not talked about enough. So yeah. I appreciate your transparency in that. So um, before we end off, is there anything that you would like to mention that hasn't been touched on for somebody listening? Kind of a last note. You know, I think if you're like, you know, a coach, consultant, service provider, um, it's really important to think about are your goals actually realistic? Because a lot of people go like, oh, I'll make 10K a month. Well, cool. Go divide 10K by the price of your offer. And is that number realistic? Not just in, let's say it's you're charging $1,000 a month. Cool. So you need 10 clients. Okay. Can you realistically keep up with 10 clients? Yes. Great. But what's the work involved before you get to 10 clients? So for example, you know, with if you need three sales calls to get one client, that means you need to do 30 sales calls this month to close 10 clients to make $10,000. And now what's the marketing you have to do to get, book 30 sales calls? So break it down. A lot of people don't realize this math and that's what comes and bites them in the ass basically when they think they're not hitting their goals because they haven't worked this out. And if that's you and you're listening, then... It's not your fault. This this doesn't get talked about enough. So I hope this is helpful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, reverse engineer it. Figure out your goals and then kind of reverse engineer that math from there. So where can people find you online? Yeah, um, come hang out with me on LinkedIn um, or Instagram um, at Maggie Gila. And um, I've got some free resources as well that's going to help you. Um, that are going to help you with uh, getting more clients and booking more sales calls and closing those sales calls so you can help more people. You've just listened to the Work, Wealth, and Travel podcast. If anything from this episode stuck out to you, I would really appreciate if you share the episode on your socials or share it with a friend. And of course, be sure to tag me. As always, thank you for joining me on this learning journey, and I will see you in next week's episode.